generally it attracts a lot of people who think about the future a lot. So and people who, not all of them, not not all of not all of them, but a lot, a big chunk of people who think about activist issues or or just about how to make our planet better. And I think um, you know stepping into the NFT space really uh, opened me up to meeting a lot of people who happen to have capital for whatever reason and who care about human rights issues um so it's it's a great um it's a great tool for building connections with people who care matt what's happening man how are you feeling another day another nft now podcast i can't complain there we there we go who we got lined up today Really excited about our guest today. We have Nadia Tolikonikova, the co-founder of Pussy Riot, the Russian feminist and activist collective, which has notably protested against Vladimir Putin and in support of women's rights and LGBTQ rights. You may, you may remember back in 2012, they made international headlines after they were jailed following a performance inside a Moscow church. And they've since become very active in the NFT space. Um, recently, they released uh, Virgin Mary, Please Become a Feminist, a one of one on Super Rare, which featured Pussy Riot's hand-drawn artwork across a copy of their actual prison sentencing documents uh, back from 2012. Uh, it sold for 40 ETH alongside their 333-piece ACAB drop, with all proceeds going to charity, supporting victims of domestic violence, political prisoners, and more. Nadia has been at the forefront of the intersection of NFTs and activism. What are you excited about, Sam? Yeah, I think she is doing a, a fantastic job at really unleashing the social impact potential of NFTs and Web3. I, I know this comes up commonly in our conversations that Web3 and NFTs are really giving us a, an opportunity to, to rewrite the rules, create new structures, new systems that bring power back to creators and their communities. But in doing so, it's, it's critical that we be intentional around fostering this equitability, giving and creating more equitable future for underrepresented people. I think this is very much at the forefront of a lot of what Nadia and Pussy Ride are doing. And I, I think the way in which she's baking that into the different NFTs she's doing, how she's being thoughtful around the different utility, and how she's really just using NFTs to, to tell these stories, drive awareness to these various causes. I think another interesting thing that, that came up that stood out to me is just this notion of kind of a toxic positivity in the space. I think there's still like, despite the potential that we have to rewrite the rules, we are seeing a lot of the same structures um, uh, emerge within the NFT and Web3 community, right? So I think the toxic positivity component there is that we need to make sure that this isn't all optimism. Um, it's, it's up to us and we need to think beyond our own interests and our own interests on the products that we're building, but more broadly around how we can collectively look out for each other to foster this more equitable future for underrepresented people. And Nadia is at the forefront of doing just that. Um, so obviously you're going to have an incredible conversation, really excited to dive in. And if you haven't already got it, got to sneak it in here, but make sure you sign up for our newsletter, nftnow.com. We distill what's happening in the wonderful world of NFTs into a weekly newsletter. Um, so definitely sign up for that if you haven't already, but without any further ado, Nadia Tolikonikova. Nadia, so happy to have you on the NFT Now podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good. What's going on? Doing good as well, just closing out the year strong. Um, you know, I think why don't we kick things off um, by just talking about what is the, the mission of Pussy Riot and how did your experiences founding it and also protesting against Putin in Russia help shape your views on decentralization? We started in 2011 as a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, we were arguably the first DAO uh, ever existed because um, we don't have um, we don't have like final list of membership like we are truly decentralized anyone anyone can join um, and uh, we always uh, would um, say that this is such an important uh, value for us uh, not to have leaders or people who will uh, prohibit um, anyone from entering. So, well, basically, unless you're doing something that's not ethical, according to most of the members, you can do whatever you want. So um, it started in 2011. Um, and the goal of Pussy Riot is uh, to empower women and uh, LGBTQ plus people. And um, it still remains the same. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, really important um, right now. <laughs> 
<laughs> in crypto because uh, they um, we're so so far, far from parity um, and um, equality when it comes to numbers in crypto and NFTs. Um, so the goal is to um, make sure that all genders are equal. They're equally treated. They have um, uh, equal opportunities. So we um, we run a lot of um, organizations that provide um, uh, organizations and programs that provide uh, different kinds of, kinds of opp opportunities to people. And uh, we're working right now on Pussyverse, um, which is uh, part of which is going to be fund for up and coming female artists in the NFT space. Um, and um, also one of our important goals is to get rid of Vladimir Putin. Um, we did not succeed um, with that one yet, but um, I say that we went a long way since um, since the moment we started. Uh, because um, the biggest reward for me right now is to go to a concert in Russia and see all those girls, uh, 16, 17 years old girls, who are coming to me and saying that they became feminists because of Pussy Riot, or um, someone would uh, tell me that um, they um, came out of closet. Because of um, because of us, and that's um, that's a big big step. Because we actually, without um, without necessarily getting getting rid of our government yet, we're already somehow changing people's lives and building alternative Russia within Russia, and uh, we're building this decentralized, better, more kind, beautiful Russia. Um, and the reason why our government fears us so much because uh, we are pretty effective in building this alternative network. And that's the reason why I'm excited about crypto because uh, these tools are helping us to, um, you know, uh, go go beyond and um, grow even bigger. That's amazing. No, no, and I love that too. And it's, I mean, it even seems to like the decentralized autonomous organization you were into it before it was even a, a, a thing or before it's become as popular as it has within the crypto and Web3 community. So in that vein, though, what was kind of like the, and I, I love the underlying mission and ethos, and it does seem like there are some similarities with what Web3 and NFTs can enable, but can you just speak to what was kind of the, the first point when you your interest was peaked about NFTs, about Web3, and what really it kind of excites you about the technologies that play there? Um, NFTs came to my life organically. I um, have a lot of friends and, well, and myself in the intersection of tech and art and activism. Um, and I believe that um, artists and activists, they should uh, explore on whatever uh, new technologies um, appearing because the thing is just going to change your life no matter what is, is happening. It's like a train that goes, <laughs> goes in, uh, towards you and then you can decide what you do about it. You can jump on the train and have a nice ride or it can just be hit by this train and die um so, so i don't i want to i want us all to use these opportunities for um better and the the reason why i as an activist i have to think about technology because i i'm in a unique position of thinking about ethics most of my life and i feel like i can make sure that we collectively don't die from using technological tools obviously not just me a lot of people think about ethics but i think it's so important for activists not to look um, look back from new technology. And even if some things are scary, uh, just go there and um, and confront it. So I, I think if you combine ethics and um, technology, then um, you can build a bright new future. If you don't apply ethics, like, I don't really know where we're going to come. We might as well destroy ourselves as species. So um, this why for me as an activist always was super important to be uh, in this intersection of um, activism and tech. So that's how I um, learned about NFTs. And I made my first NFT release in March of uh, 2021. Um, I've heard about it earlier, uh, but my first, uh, my own step um, was called Panic Attack. It was uh, released on Foundation on um, my ever first release um was sold for 100 ease 
Um, it's called uh, Panic Attack Terrestrial Paradise. And um, the piece was about mental health and about, um, about climate change. And <laughs> I remember it was a, a really interesting choice for me because uh, the piece was about climate change and I'm from one of the most um, most polluted places on earth. It's a little city called Norilsk, got a little, little industrial city. And the piece that I released on foundation and that was sold totally for 178 ETH um, was inspired by my childhood that I spent in my home city where the snow is literally black after 30 minutes um, just because of uh, just because of pollution. Um, and I remember uh, having a lot of conversations inside my activist community if, if it's worth it to step into the energy game because um, as we know Ethereum uses proof of work and it's like really energy consuming so I had to um, go through all of that and learn um, learn everything really quickly in three days and learn um, everything about Ethereum 1, Ethereum 2 and proof of stake and proof of work and um, everyone makes choice for themselves but I, I decided that uh, it worth for me to step in and actually try to change whatever I can change from within. Um, and this um, new space was exciting for me because uh, because it was uh, because it is still new and flexible. And uh, if you bring your values to to the space, like there is a big chance that it's going to people are going to listen and people here um, love to listen. Um, people here still not that much about gatekeeping as uh, there are in more traditional established industries. So my bet was to step in and um, do good. And uh, we sent a big portion of that sale to a shelter for victims of domestic violence based in Russia, in uh, one of the Southern uh, Republics of Russia where women are still treated as furniture, basically. So, and if you smile to um, a wrong person, if you smile to a stranger, then it means that you, you put a shame on your family and you have to be murdered for that. So we, uh, we saved life, the lives of those women and we were able to bring them from um, that region to Moscow and from Moscow to um, outside of Russia because um, that's that was a safe place for them. Um, so I'm personally excited about NFTs that do good. Uh, I think NFTs can be a great instrument for change. And I speak, uh, talk a lot with my friends uh, inside of the industry space about it. What, we have an incredible amount of capital and influence here right now. So what if, if you channel, like what if everyone who sells an NFT channels like 20, 30% to something that they're really, really passionate about? I feel like we can change so much. I love that. I love that. And I think that, you know, the, the NFT community's capacity to make a social impact. I think we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of that potential. And it's really exciting to see you like at the forefront of that. Um, I'd love to also hear your thoughts kind of like stepping back and zooming out and also looking forward. Like, what do you think Web3 will mean for activism? And how can NFTs, you know, help causes and nonprofits sort of foster the meaningful social change that they're uh, looking to bring about in the world? Let me give you an example. Today, um, I just got super exciting news. Um, um, an artist uh, who I supported um, he's an honorary member of Pussyverse, um, honorary because he happens to be male, but he's a prisoner, so he's um, he's hurtful from vulnerable groups, so that's why I allowed him to be become a member of Pussyverse. Uh, he is an artist based in Russia, based in Russian prison. He's serving time right now for having some weed in his pocket. He's serving six years in jail. Um, he happens to have access to internet and he um, he draws and he drew my portrait and uh, he released it in foundation and he sold it for one is point uh, three, which is um, maybe for a lot of people in the NFC, like not so much, but uh, for a person who is sitting in Russian jail, it's actually life changing money. It's um, um, around five thousand dollars and uh, one third of those money he donated to a shelter for victims of domestic, domestic violence in Russia. And that's the best example for me. And it's just one sale. I mean, he can do he can do more. It wasn't his first one. It's not it's not his last one. Um, you know, it enables people, no matter where they are, to participate in um, in global processes. So um, it 
it opens up creativity, creativity and changes lives of people who are living outside of big metropolitan areas. Um, and for me, it's really important because I was growing up in a small city and I felt like personally to actually become an artist and uh, build a career, I have to leave my city. But at the same time, it was painful because I'm losing part of my identity. I'm not close to my family anymore. But at the time, um, when I was 16, I decided I need to leave my home city. So today you don't have to do that. You can be local if you choose so, but at the same time, you can be global. So uh, crypto, NFT market, truly global enables you to do that. Um, and it gives activists a um, really great tool for raising money for their causes. Um, partly because, yeah, it, it opens up um, it opens up the global arena for uh, reaching out to people. So you don't, you're not really limited within, um, you know, financial system of one country. Um, yeah, also, if you are critical of your government, um, it's definitely um, really helpful that you're not being, con uh, you know, controlled by um, the, um, you're, you're not working within banking system that is controlled by your government because often um, our bank accounts are being frozen. Um, so it's, um, it's easier as that um, government calls us extremists. They call us extremists for just criticizing them. And it happens in, in Russia all the time. Um, my family accounts were frozen. My friends accounts are frozen. And no matter how much money you have there, you can't use them because you're an extremist. An extremist. Um, so yeah, crypto comes in. Um, you know, a, a lot of media outlets and um, human rights organizations they're switching to crypto just because it's much more safe and it's not trackable by by our main enemy, who is the government. Um, and well, uh, and I think another point is that um, crypto has generally it attracts a lot of people who think about the future a lot so and people who not all of them not not all of not all of them but a, a lot a big chunk of people who think about activist issues or or just about how to make our planet better and i think um you know stepping into the nft space really uh opened me up to meeting a lot of people who happen to have capital for whatever reason, and who care about human rights issues, um, so it's it's a great um, it's a great tool for building connections with people who care. Yeah, no, it's uh, incredible. I absolutely love all of that, and I think what's interesting too is how you're, you're just kind of speaking to some of the ways in which the technology can be used to foster some of the, uh, break various barriers. But I, I think it's interesting because we do have this opportunity to largely rewrite the rules as to how different creators and their communities are engaging. But at the same time too, it, it's very easy for some of these historical legacy barriers, be it um, gender inequities, racial inequities to also be pervasive in this new world. So yeah. when you think about that, I mean, how do you think we can make sure that as we are building this new world, it is more equitable from a gender and racial and just uh, in general? It's incredibly important. You and you cannot <laughs> you cannot underestimate how stressful and frustrating for me uh, that I see a lot of these old problems moving to Web three. Um, I think it's unfortunately quite natural because. This is just, I mean, this is just a tool and tool without ethics is going to just enhance whatever, um, whatever structural inequalities you already have. In order to change it, um, you need an, a conscious intervention. And I really hope that 2022 will have a lot of programs, funds, um, accelerators for uh, for underrepresented people. And I think it's in our best interest to do that. It's like, it's not only up to us women um, or any other uh, underrepresented communities to, to do that. It's up to everyone because, you know, when you come to a crypto party, you don't want to, like, who, who do you want to hang out with? You want to hang out just with the white boys or you want to 
hang out with girls and gays. And I think everyone's answer will be girls and gays. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, completely agree. And, and I think you raised like really important points. Um, what I'd love to hear your thoughts too, kind of even looking further into the, into the future. Um, we're thinking about building the metaverse and the metaverse has become such a, a, a common topic of conversation in the space. How are you thinking about the metaverse from the perspective of activism, from the perspective of identity, and also from the perspective of achieving Pussy Riot's mission? A perspective of what? Of um, like activism, identity, and then also, you know, the mission for Pussy Riot. For Pussy Riot. Um, well, I think it's not going to be one metaverse, right? It's going to be um, a bunch of metaverses. Um, so there is that. Um, I mean, I don't really think it's going to change um, somehow um, whatever we're, we're doing. Um, I think a lot of people say that um, identity is going to be so different because uh, uh, because a lot of people are going to be anonymous, but I don't actually see that so many at least artists are um, I prefer to be anonymous. I think our experiences are so important. Um, so we're just like going to bring whatever experiences we have in, in real life to the metaverse. I don't know. I don't have a good answer to this question. What is your, um, how do you think your work is going to be different in the metaverse? It's a good question. I mean, I, I agree with you that I feel like there are going to be multiple metaverses. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's something I've been thinking a bit about is like, there will be some of these, you know, larger ones, you know, like the Decentralands, the crypto voxels, the sandboxes that exist right now, who knows if it's them, you know, 10 years down the road, but, but they, you know, these kind of larger worlds. But I think what's going to be really interesting is these smaller worlds that are more niche and more like more centered around people who have similar passions or similar beliefs, you know, the whole idea of like finding your tribe, you know, when we grew up, we had to find you know, just someone in our same geographical radius who like resonated with our thoughts. And now, you know, the world and, and all of its, all of its people are at our disposal or at our, at our reach, kind of at our fingertips through this. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how different communities and, and, um, uh, like kind of form and, and instead of just having to necessarily like occupy or, or carve out a space within a world, they can create their own. I'm really curious how it's going to clash with, uh, nation states. That's that's a big question to me because I felt like nation state um, paradigm outlived itself a long time ago. So I'm personally an anarchist um, and believed in deeply in anarchism since I was 14. Um, so I don't really believe in borders. Unfortunately, they still believe in me. I have to get visas like pretty much everywhere as a Russian citizen. Um, but it makes little sense to me, honestly. And, and, and I think eventually um, those like meaning of nation states are going to be changing. I don't really know where it's going to come, but like this is, a, this is the first question I am addressing everyone who says that they're a political scientist. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, you know, I think, it like, is... if you think about it, like, you know, basically information and money and, um, and goods they're moving um, almost freely through borders, like pretty much freely. Um, but the people, though, they still cannot. And it feels weird to me. Um, it feels really weird because capital can just flow freely, but I, I can't. And uh, mm -hmm. um, I think in the future, it has somehow will have to be addressed. Absolutely. You know, it's really refreshing to get your perspective, um, you know, to, to have, you know, activism at the forefront of this. Uh, I'm curious if there are um, other artists or other um, you know, people in the NFT space that our listeners may not be aware of, but that you think are doing really great work and, and want to help shed a light on, on them as well. Oh, I think Latasha does great work. I think people are aware of her, um, but she's building a great community and she's empowering women. Um, that's amazing um well um <laughs> people pleaser um probably aware of her as well uh people pleaser sold her first artwork for 310 east and she gave it all 100 percent to charities um that's how pleaser dow that i'm a member of uh was formed um uh, ix shells um Another amazing artist member of uh, Blizzard DAO as well. She um, she donated 500 ETH, 100 percent of her um, cell of uh, one of her artworks to the, the Tor project. 
So those are those are my favorite girls. Uh, probably can I probably didn't name a lot. Well, I know one one another really really big uh, female artist in space, but and I know that she donates fifty percent of every sale she does, but she never tells about it publicly. So I wouldn't name uh, name her. But you know what I noticed that um, girls are uh, more likely to donate and more likely to build um, safe networks for um, for others. And I don't think it's something that's in um, females' core, whatever. I'm not an essentialist, so I don't believe that females are somehow like really different from males. I think it's it comes from um, our experience of being uh, underrepresented. So we can connect with other people who are underrepresented as well, and we feel more empathetic towards them. So I guess one of the uh, one of the things we have to really somehow change is to make those who have privilege to feel more empathetic towards those who are underrepresented. Because what I felt a lot in my conversations with guys in space. They are so positive about everything, and sometimes I feel like I'm just like bringing, um, just bringing bad news to the table uh, because these news are real. I mean, this is like what I'm, um, what I'm encountering on a daily basis, and you know, sometimes in the NFT space, people act to me like Harvey Weinstein. They, uh, they, they like verbally sexually harass harass me, and. That's what we have to do on a daily basis and we shouldn't. Um, and so it's really difficult to make men to feel like, oh, yeah, it's valid. Like normally they, a lot of them, they dismiss it being like, oh, it's, uh, don't worry. Just like, just smile. It's going to be fine. Just do great art. You're, uh, you don't sail. You're, you're sailing for less than males. Don't worry. Um, it's just, it's just about the quality of your art, girl. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that that, that uh, toxic optimism is and toxic positivity is actually uh, like a very real issue worth just even uh, glad we kind of got here too. Because I, I think just the sense of intentionality that we all really need to bring into the space as we engage beyond just our own interests and our own projects is critical. Because I there just is this opportunity to very much rewrite and rebuild a lot of these structures from the ground up. And if that's the afterthought, then it's all it's not, nothing means there it's just going to be the same inequities yeah. that are carrying their way into this new future it's going to be like egyptian revolution remember 2011 um <laughs> um i was running around moscow being like we have to um we have to make sure that feminism and uh lgbtq plus rights are in the core of whatever revolution that we're about to do we didn't do revolution in, in russia uh, but at the same time, revolution in Egypt was happening. And I know from from people who I know from there, uh, they had similar conversations and they would be, no, let's make a revolution first. Let's get rid of Mubarak. And then we talk about feminism. And then and then they um, ended up in even a more conservative place than they used to be. Because it, it has to come first. Or we have to form our values and then act. It cannot come as an afterthought. I completely agree with you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. You know, one one question just popped into my head. You know, I, I, given the fact that Pussy Riot has operated as a decentralized organization, you know, as you said for for, for you know better part of a decade, um, what do you think are are potentially some lessons that you've learned from that, or that that can be applied to you know perhaps new entrants to the space who are thinking about DAOs, thinking about about organizing in a decentralized manner and want to make a a positive social change. No lessons, <laughs> just do it. Um, unfortunately, nothing. Didn't didn't learn nothing. Uh, I mean, it's like it's pretty different because like we do art and uh, DAOs. Um, they're. I mean, yeah. I think it's it's not really applicable. <laughs> cool. Well, I, I guess to, one one thing that would be great to speak to as well is that I know. Um, 
some of the art you've released and the NFTs you've released have, have really kind of helped lay a precedent, break trail, unleash some of the, the potential of this technology. We'd love for you just to talk us a little bit through Virgin Mary, Please Become a Feminist, and then the kind of 333 digital drawings. Kind of, you could just set the stage with the, the backstory that, that inspired you and what is ultimately the story you're really trying to tell and communicate through the art there. That'd be fantastic. Thank you for asking about that. <clears throat> I love vaginas. Um, so, <laughs> a visionary, please become a feminist, uh, is um, a piece that I made a few months ago. Uh, it's uh, it's a piece that's dedicated to um, ten years uh, ten years of pussy ride and nine years of uh, us being convicted. Um, we were con convicted to two years in jail in thousand. 12 and those papers that you see behind the piece these are my prison sentencing papers a lot of people say this they're like oh what is what are these newspapers and i'm like girl <laughs> these are papers that brought me to jail for two years and then they change in phase um but it was difficult for me to work with those papers because um obviously they bring a lot of traumatic memories uh, but my goal was to turn them into something positive uh, for myself and for other people and so for me like this is an example of not toxic positivity when you acknowledge oh sorry there is a problem and that's how we're going to fix it and let's work on that so i'm I'm super dedicated to be positive. I think positivity is a great thing, but so when you admit that there is a problem and uh, I said there is a positivity as a tool to change this problem and it's not just positivity for the sake of it, um, then I'm all for it. Um, so I applied this really cute uh, paintings and document and the central painting is um, Virgin Mary in the shape of vagina. Uh, and it says, Virgin Mary, please become a feminist. And um, around um, um, around the um, the square, you, you will see like smaller little vignettes, um, like burning police cars, and and different oh different instruments for um, for anarchism and activism, like I don't know knives and bombs and Molotov cocktails and ice cream because you also need to add ice cream to make a revolution um, um so then um, um my uh, my problem with one of ones always was um they're really exclusive and elitist so uh, i remember after first um after my first uh, four pieces um panic attack um i decided to step out from making um for making nfts because i realized that they they forced me to talk only to wealthy people and i historically um i hang with different people i'm not against wealthy people but it's just like my crowd is always so different um and i feel like home with different people normally um but when you sell one of ones then um you know, you you want them to go for a big price. You inevitably and end up end up um, trying to find whales and you know convince them to buy your art, which is um, just great. I met a lot of great friends uh, doing that, but uh, I always wanted uh, Pussyrides art to be more um, more open to the general public. So then, me and so I was just complaining to my friend Trippy about it and. Uh, he was like, why don't you just take all these little paintings and release them as a collection? And I did that um, and um, I added some more paintings and um, the collection is called uh, ACAB. Um, ACAB stands for All Cops Are Bastards um, and has 333 pieces. It's a uh, Bussereds Genesis collection and has tons of great utilities. Um, like you can go to Bussereds concerts and events you know i was um putting people on the list for for dreamverse and for friends with benefits events and for they got tickets to um vip tickets to trip this um festival during our puzzle so it's a great 
tool for uh, for building my community. Um, besides that, it serves as a mint pass to um, all my future collections. Well, um, only only if um, the supply is less than 333 of my future collection, obviously I can guarantee everyone to get on it. But uh, if it's more like in our upcoming collection with Gremlin, um, everyone who has a cab, um, they are automatically on a whitelist for Gremlin. And you know, sometimes they get just a cute little presents and other NFTs from me. Um, besides just holding a really, um, really rad piece of history because um, it's not just a drawing, it's not just a newspaper, it's actually a part of a uh, prison sentence of Pussy Riot, you know, that document that actually shook the whole world in 2012. Yeah, well, that's absolutely incredible and commend you for the work and I think in, in lots of different layers that all kind of contribute to its greatness. I think on one side, I mean, there's the, the intentionality of the, the story and uh, and also just the, the story that's bigger than yourself and really using this as a, a kind of means to create awareness around impactful issues and, and foster um, a, a deeper conversation there. I think on the other side too, is just the, there's a lot of, I mean, I'm curious in a sec, we'll dive into the impact NFTs will have in music, but I think there's a lot of musicians that are not really unleashing the potential of NFTs as it pertains to how it can create utility. So even just hearing you speak through some of those different elements of utility and really you using this project to help kind of lay a foundation for how other artists can actually engage in the space is really powerful. In that in that vein, like when you think about the like as a musician and other musician peers, like what how do you feel NFTs will impact the music industry and how musicians grow and engage their community? Um, <clears throat> I think it inevitably will impact um, everyone because I know that um, labels. And pretty much every big corporation right now, they're looking into NFTs and or they're actively participating. Um, whether it's announced like Adidas or Nike or uh, it's not like I know I know all of them are um, balls deep in NFTs. Um, and what I don't like is that a lot of musicians who are part of those labels because they're locked in contracts in like long-term deals with them they cannot write this rules for them like um terms for themselves and this kind of gains web3 right so it's basically corporations are getting interested in nfts and um they are deciding for the artist how are they going to participate in this new world which goes against the whole ethics of the um web3 uh but I mean, this is just road bumps on the way. Um, I think um, I think eventually everyone will have to take like stance on um, what an NFT will do in their career, um, and um, I think also with Ethereum switching to proof of stake, hope is going to happen really soon. Like it's going to be so much easier for musicians to participate because um, you know a lot of uh, my friends, musicians, they don't do that just because of env environmental impact. And I know that there are um, NFTs on uh, different blockchains, but, um, you know, still you'll find your biggest collectors and biggest collector base and on Ethereum. So um, it's like, I know a lot of people are just waiting for um, Ethereum to switch to proof of stake. Um, I think... Um, you know what um what justin blau does is extremely interesting um it they kind of helps it, it, it really helps um, musicians not to be locked into big record labels and then be truly independent that's incredibly promising um but you know he's like his company is just like one of fruits that you can take you also can um use um uh, nft music nft platforms like catalog or a um, million, <laughs> million of them um, and really find your art by yourself. And Latasha here is such a great example of an artist who, um, or Verite, um, they don't have a huge following. Like I don't have huge following either, but uh, before we, without a record label, we would not be able to 
I mean, it was really difficult for us to make money to pour back into our art. So with NFTs, it became much, much more, much easier. And you don't have to be such a hustler like me, because uh, I was independent all my life, but it, it was extremely difficult. <laughs> so sometimes you literally have to just, you know, make handmade clothes and, and go sell it and then um, and then put it back into your art. And not everyone can, can do that. They, there are just people who are not as such a big hustler as me. So, <laughs> um, so NFTs definitely opens up um, a lot of possibilities for independent careers. I love that. I love that. You know, and kind of jumping off just the utility side too, I'd love to think a little bit about and talk a little bit about how NFT sort of changed the creative canvas for you as, as a creator. You know, like I grew up listening to like punk bands like Crass, where like the music was just as important as like, as like the words. They would hand out like lyric sheets at all their shows because like the words were just as important. Music was one medium, like written word was one medium. And, you know, as a musician yourself with a message and with, and with causes that you support, how, how do NFTs as a medium sort of enable you uh, or, or change that uh, f- for you as a creative? Mm, it's one of the tools. Um, so I'm, first of all, a conceptual artist. I don't even, um, I mean, I refer to myself as a musician um, often just for the sake of, um, just for the sake of being easy. But um, I started as a conceptual artist and I think this is um, an umbrella under which anything is possible. And that's the beauty of conceptual art because it opens up to you so like pretty much endless possibilities and endless mediums and none of these doors is closed um it's crazy for me to think how some of my friends musicians they can't even switch a genre of music they play i i'm switching daily from drawing to making music videos to editing music videos to leading a media company to um leading an nft project um what else who knows who knows what i'm going to do tomorrow and i think if you didn't study about conceptual art maybe it will not be life-changing for you but just take a day and really sit with wikipedia and study what they did i think they um they lifted up an iron curtain that was telling people that you have to find just one path in your life. And it's not, it's not the case um, anymore, at least. Um, current economy, um, current creator economy, as they say, you can literally be like a- a- anyone. And I feel like NFTs is just one of these really exciting mediums uh, for me to experiment with. And um, dynamic NFTs are so interesting. <laughs> we are preparing collection right now with Gremlin and uh, we're going to have dynamic elements there. Um, so, okay, this is literally the first time I'm saying that. But I'm not going to regret it, no? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely um, not. Definitely not. No regrets. <laughs> no regrets in NFTs. <laughs> um, it's going to help. So, if it's an NFT collection, all girls NFT collection, and they are going to have um, all different ages because there are a bunch of um, NFT collections dedicated to girls, but um, most of them are still the same age and often the same body type. And actually, it just comes from, you know, it's easier to generate a collection when it's the same body type, but, you know, we decided to not pick a easier route and um, create different body types and and ages was especially important for me because I feel like the older you get, the more difficult for you to be somehow meaningfully represented in um, in culture. Um, so um, we're going to have um, old women who are going to be the rarest ones and everyone's going to be uh, wanting to have an old lady. Um, I call them evolved. Uh, and uh, you're going to have uh, some of them, some of people are going to get um, an artificial womb for the baby 
because I believe that in the future, a woman will be able to decide if she wants to use her own body for reproduction or she wants to use an artificial womb. Because as someone who produced a baby, it's a big life-changing experience. And I don't think that everyone has to go through that in order to have a baby because it's crazy what's happening with your body. So I think in the future, it's like you can just be like, oh yeah, it's just going to happen here in a cup. Um, so if you're going to get um, this artificial womb that, and you hold it long enough, you're going to get another NFT. And there's going to be a couple of more features. I'm not going to tell yet about them, but um, it's just so interesting what you can do when you work with your um, own custom smart contract. And that's what I'm encouraging artists to do. Um, well, and like, you know, platforms are fine. Um, it's like a good entry point for um, for NFTs, but I, I think it's such an exciting uh, journey when you pair yourself with amazing developers who have great ideas. And I'm working with Katie from IndieDAO. Um, she's a girl developer with like amazing network of uh, other girls developers, and that's a part of my ethos as well. I'm I'm working with girls, and like so. Whatever money we're generating, I want it to go back to girls and empower more girls and they're going to do the same and then we're going to change the statistics. Um, so my long-term goal is to um, be able to empower more female artists and also teach them about this, like all that I learned this year. Like you can mint it on the platform. You can also... Like I can help you to find this developer who is going to help you to write your own contract and you're going to be 100% in charge of what you're doing. So these are amazing tools and um, paints and brushes for me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And you know, thank you for that insight into the upcoming project. You know, we're, 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 big, <laughs> we're, big, fans of, we're big fans of Gremlin over at NFT Now. We've, we've interviewed him before. And, I just um, dropped Alpha. I just yeah, dropped alpha. We're, we're here for the Alpha at <laughs> NFT Now. <That's, laughs> <laughs> we're all about it. Um, you know, that that sounds amazing. And I know I know you're working on so many different things. Are are there any other projects that are upcoming that uh that you're working on that you can tell us about or that you, you want to <laughs> tease now? Um, well, there is a 3D um 3D avatar project coming up. Uh it's gonna happen after Gremlin Drop. And it's uh it's called Big Tick Girls. And um so yeah, like we're building uh, different characters, um, also different body types, and but I'm not going to tell you anything like in details about that. But they look they look fucking awesome, <laughs> so detailed. And some of them have um, I don't know like tentacles instead of their instead of their hands because uh, women are all so different, and like we are all presented just with one type of a girl, and I'm just really tired of it. I was so um, pissed when I came to IMBU for the first time it was during pandemic. It was before all the talks about metaverse, but you know, basically they were building metaverse for a while. Do you know IMBU, this game with avatars where you can pick your avatar. Um, so first of all, uh, they have just two genders, male and female. And I was like, wait a second. And what am like, what? Like there are a lot of other options that are not covered here. And, and then I mean, big female, the, the only body type you can have is like this. And I was like, wait a second, I'm not, I'm not feeling represented by this. Um, and um, I mean, needless to say, you can't find um, older women in, in this game. And then in most, most of the games, which is crazy if you think and really think about it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well. Uh, Nadia, it's, it's really exciting to see thought leaders like you building in Web3. You know, I think you're, you're a vitally needed voice in the space and i um, really thankful that uh, you're able to join us on the NFT Now podcast. It was fun. We had fun <laughs> I too. I love talking to you. We can go another hour. We can run it back. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Nadia. Take care. 
Man, well, that was a, a really incredible conversation. Just love the intentionality. And, and now she's really diving into the, these different use cases within NFTs. We're really just using this kind of this medium, this technology as a mechanism of really pushing forth some of the, the causes that are near and dear to her art and that uh, collectively all of us really need to pay attention to and, and think as to how we can engage and support as well. Absolutely. It was amazing hearing her articulate her journey and how uh, her experiences and her convictions uh, have led her to Web3. And I think we need more builders like her in the space. I think we need more people who uh, have strong beliefs and want to make a social change and use Web3 and use NFTs as a, as a means and as a method and as a medium for enacting and making that impact. Uh, so I, it was great to hear her perspective across the board. I think she made so many important points around uh, representation, inclusion, diversity, and also, uh, you know, the idea of this toxic positivity, this idea that, uh, you know, there are so many people in the NFT space who are speaking from a place of privilege. And uh, I think it's an important gut check for everyone in the space to have. Yeah, well, there you have it. Really appreciate all of you for tuning in and supporting as always. Um, definitely check out Nadia, check out Pussy Ride if you haven't already. And on that note, we are out. Thank you. Thank you.